All right, folks, uh, how are we doing out there? This is uh, Captain Jack, and I am joined here, and I'm very happy to say that I'm joined here by uh, Mr. Bob Grant. And uh, one thing one thing I've learned, Bob, and it's from doing this stream, is I finally figured out, and this is this is beyond you, I finally figured out what goes up on the, on the YouTube is the title that goes on to the uh, the restream or sorry from here so I, I it, it's a work in progress but I'm just happy that we are here right now and uh, we are going out via YouTube and everybody is watching us and uh, we are we are definitely going to be having our show tonight so hopefully we'll get some more people out here and we're going to be talking about some good things here on Labor Day and if you are not familiar with who Bob Grant is. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a, a quick preliminary, and uh, Don Webb, permission to come aboard is granted. Uh, Bob, Bob Grant is a uh, NFL player, played in the late 60s, early 70s for the, uh, the Baltimore Colts, Washington Redskins, uh, the Philadelphia team uh, uh, in the WFL, and it was another team as well. Great stories, by the way, that we, when we had him on before. And uh, took the uh, the auspices of that great playing career, and and afterwards went and uh, made inroads into the uh, into what is the we know now know is the retired NFL Players Congress, and obviously he will talk about all those salient points. Um, uh, Bob, you obviously were also a pioneer in the civil rights movement of the 60s. And, uh, I mean, you could talk about your NFL career. You can go back and hit some of the things that I might have missed. But uh, I'd like for you to, to probably hit my highlights and talk about what it what is really important to you about your background and you being at the forefront of getting athletes with the right people for uh, civil rights in the United States starting back in the 1960s? Uh, well, Cap, the, uh, in 1963, and ni well, prior to 1963 and 1964, at the major universities in the South, there were no black players. Uh, that was during that time, a uh, little apartheid, but you know, segregation in uh, this country. In 1963 and 1964, two schools decided that they were finally going to integrate college sport in the South. Those two schools were the University of Maryland, which was north of the Mason-Dixon line, and Darrell Hill went there, transferred from the Naval Academy, uh, and then Wake Forest, south of the Mason-Dixon line in the old in Dixie, the old Confederacy. Um, you know, was the first school, um, you know, in the South, I guess. A lot of schools have taken credit for it, but uh, Wake Forest and Maryland were the two schools that uh, did it. There were four of us, Darrell Hill in Maryland, myself, uh, and Kenneth Henry, Butch Henry, and William Smith, Dr. William Smith now, out of Boston at Wake Forest. There were... Obviously, just so two, three years before then, James Meredith had gone into Ole Miss, and that was a very difficult time there. Oh, some months before we went in there, the church down in Birmingham, Alabama, was bombed, in which the all of the the young kids were killed down there. Um, I'm, I'm I'm making this point because on uh, some of the things I want to discuss today, you know, here, I didn't see the civil rights movement in a movie and I didn't read it in a book and uh, nobody told me about it. I lived it, I was in the middle of it. Uh, at Wake Forest uh, your University, we had some people who I uh, were on board, the president of the school, the coach, Bill Tate, the players on the team, and just a few students, a few of the faculty. 
Otherwise, um, there was no one that was on board at Wake Forest for what uh, the dean of men at that time told me was an experiment that uh, he wasn't really for, for, and uh, I shouldn't count on him for anything. So I did not count on him for anything. I will capsulize you know, for everyone uh, what it was like. Uh, we didn't play against any other black players because there were no other black players playing at any of the major universities in the South. When we played Maryland, they had Daryl, and then they brought some more guys on up there as well. But with uh, Clemson, South Carolina, Florida State, Auburn, um, name any of the rest of the schools there, South Carolina, Georgia Tech, there were no other blacks. So whenever we went into a stadium to play uh, on Saturday, uh, we would look up in the stands and there would be no black people in the stands. And you all know how big football is in the South, even back then, when the stadium, stadiums were smaller for college ball, you would have 40 and 50,000 people in the stands. The only other black faces that we would see uh, on game day would usually be the grounds crew, the guys who were raking the grass and cleaning up there. But that was that was okay. Um, you know, quite frankly, it was a kind of difficult time in that we had you know, in the South, over on the white side, we had probably three different kinds of people. We had some people, few people, few, I say, who were just downright racist. Uh, we had some other people who were really class conscious, and they separated Black people and poor whites not quite equally, but in the same way. And then we had some other people who associated freely with Blacks, but they had to be very careful. Our situation on campus at Wake Forest is uh, with the three of us, and then we brought on about three more guys the second year. Like, you know, there, our life was our community was the three of us the first year and the six or so of us the second like your year and the other athletes on the team uh, in regards to uh, most of the other people there because of peer pressure there were I think we had counted them up one time there were probably 26 people on campus who were relatively comfortable with us and in other instances especially if it was a female we could say hello and they would start walking fast. So you know, they were meeting us on campus, they go somewhere. Boy, they would look in every direction except ours and um, they would start walking fast, very, very you know, fast. You know, you know, my situation you know, was, and I think that we discussed this once before, you know, Captain Jack, you know, you know my father, uh, it was actually my grandfather who adopted me. I didn't really meet my biological father until I was 21 years old or so, and he found out that I had uh, signed a professional football contract, so he showed up then. But I was raised by you know, my grandfather, who was born in 1894, wonderful, wonderful man born in Haiti originally, and uh, came to this country with he and his brothers to Waccamaw, South Carolina, and that was near Georgetown uh, during World War I when they went into the military there. My grandfather did you know, quite well for himself. He was very good with money. He saved like your money. So in being raised by him, he had probably the largest library you know, in town. Of the 96 books, when I went to Wake Forest, they recommended that we be familiar with 12 of. Um, and those books range from you know, Shakespeare to 
uh, the Odyssey to Homer to Anne Ryan to George Orwell's 84, all of the, uh, all of that, Charles Dickens, uh, one of my favorites, uh, Mark Twain. Uh, out of the 96 books that the school wanted us to be familiar with 12 of at least, I had read 93 of those books, um, spending all of my young years with my grandfather who loved me very much, and I loved him very much. You know, not only was he uh, very successful financially, he was also a shaman uh, and uh, worked with herbs and things, you know, like that. So I was exposed to that part of my culture, uh, you know, as a black person also. Um, I played high school football for Gideon Thomas Johnson, who was one of the first Marines to go into the United States Marine Corps when they integrated the United States Marines. Some of our other coaches were those uh, black Marines who integrated the Marine Corps uh, also. And uh, they ran our high school uh, training the same way that uh, Paris Island um, boot camp and Camp Lejeune or Mumford Point uh, was uh, the uh, black part of Camp Lejeune when they integrated there the same way that it was run like you're there. You know, if you screw it up, you find yourself on the deck. Uh, Coach Gideon Johnson had the best left hand that I've ever like, you've seen. <laughs> better than Joe Frazier's, better than Muhammad Ali's. You, know, you could screw up and talk back if you wanted like you're too. You were going to end up on the deck. But a wonderful thing about this man is he loved us all. You know, discipline was the word of the day. He had the support of everyone in the community. Because anyone who played ball for Coach Gid Johnson, even if you were on second team or whatever, you were going to get our third team, you were going to be offered a scholarship someplace, uh, even if it was just to a smaller school. I had filed 40 scholarship all scholarship offered to me. You know, in my senior year, all of the traditional black uh, historical black colleges in the South, like you know, the Air Force, Michigan State. Purdue, you know, Wake Forest came on later on, a number of others in the Big Ten and a few out to your know, West uh, Arizona and those schools there. I was going to Michigan State until Coach Johnson advised me that Wake Forest was going to be integrating college sport in the South. And in his words, that's where we're going, baby. And I, I'm thinking, I said, well, I said to him, well, coach, I, I, I've already signed and agreed to go to Michigan State and they're going to win a national championship. They've got, they have players from all over the country there now, a giant out of Texas, Bubba Smith, Baba Pisa from Hawaii, Clinton Jones from all these high school All-Americans, Clinton Jones uh, out of uh, Cleveland, George Webster uh, out of South Carolina, uh, Gene Waddell. They were just loaded. So I was going to Michigan State, you know, because I wanted to be on that national championship team. And it was almost guaranteed that they were going to win a national championship. But as he said to me, no, young lad, we're going to Wake Forest. They're integrating it in. You're the man for that. That's where we are going. Now I was thinking to myself, coach, you, you, I'm not going, but I didn't dare say that to him. You <laughs> know, when he says, this is where you're going, then that is where you're where I went. So I did go to Wake Forest. Uh, you know, I, I accomplished everything at Wake Forest that I went there to accomplish. Accomplish, and of course, there were people there at that time, as there are people today uh, out here. We'll be discussing later who want you to think the way that they think. They wanted me and Butch and Smitty. They wanted us to be what they wanted us to be. And uh, that was not the way that I was raised. I was raised to think for myself. I have no problem with anyone else thinking for themselves. And I don't require any of my friends to hold the same beliefs that I do in order for us to have a relationship. Uh, in any in any way, 
Uh, we are all individuals. We have individual minds. And uh, so naturally, we're going to think like, you know, we're going to think differently. But to make things short, in regards to the college career, uh, we were threatened whenever we were on the road going to play. The telegrams came and the letters came, and phone calls came to us as black players, to the coaches and to the president of the school, Dr. Harold Trouble, you know, stating if you were going, if you bring those niggas down here, we're going to kill them. And uh, we're talking about a time when there were a lot of people around who had demonstrated that they were fully capable and willing to follow through on threats when they made those threats. Uh, there's a lot of name calling, you know, et cetera. Uh, some from some of the players on some of the other teams, and some of the other players on the other teams were not that way. Uh, they accepted you just on talent. Uh, I don't hesitate you know, to say that from the defensive line, I know that I dominated the Atlantic Coast Conference and the South during my years of play at Wake Forest and ended up being the first player drafted, the first black player ever drafted out of any of the major Southern universities into the NFL, the first black player out of any of those universities to play in a Super Bowl uh, with, uh, with, with with Baltimore. And I was the 50th player drafted when I came out in 1968. And I think that I was the second, I believe that I was the uh, second lineman that was drafted. And I switched to the linebacker in the NFL, second line defensive lineman that was drafted uh, out of the major universities in the South. So obviously, I had a good career. By the time you, I left Wake Forest, especially the last year, there were some disagreements with your know, faculty and some other like your people. And I had no love. Le I had no love for Wake Forest. Um, they put inducted me into their Hall of Fame after I guess some of uh, my old teammates and. A couple of the uh, old faculty pushed and pushed for uh, a number of like your years. They finally agreed to induct me into their Hall of Fame, but they, you know, made me wait until I was so oh, sixty some years old when uh, I think that I had earned the right to go in there. Oh, probably when I was twenty some years old, but you know that was their decision at Wake Forest today, which is a fine school like you're academically, they still refuse, and that is from top to bottom, to acknowledge or let people know that they were the school that integrated major college sport in Dixie. Uh, I've even spoken with the president of the school. He claimed uh, presently was a wonderful man, a great fundraiser, very smart man. <laughs> he claimed that he didn't know that uh, his university was the school that integrated. But I've noticed, <laughs> that, excuse me, <clears throat> I've noticed that in the few times that I've been there, whenever they have introduced me, they always introduce me as Bob Grant, one of the first black players to play for Wake Forest. Well, I was the first. Uh, and and Bob, I, Bob, I got I got to ask, and, and I, trust me, I don't like to interject and cut people off, but you would think that all by all the times that you've already uh, spoken with the alumni and for Wake Forest, that somebody in their public affairs office would finally get that into the bio that you were the first to do this and that Wake Forest was the first school to integrate into, and I, I, I will would relish not to say not quite the deep South, but definitely the South to get things done. And that would be something, especially in today's day and age, that you should be getting the credit as the person 
to to uh, you know for lack of better terms you know with Jackie Robinson to cross the the color line you were there the school was there you should get the credit and the school should get the credit well as I said cap uh, you know, I understand you know I was an independent educated person when I got there I was a conservative then I remain a conservative now I knew Dr King I knew Malcolm. I knew uh, you know, Mr. Lewis. I know Mr. Jackson you know, well. Uh, because we being the point of the spear with the four of us who were playing in the South, all of them, Stokely Carmichael, all of those people, they would come through from time to time to see us and take us out to lunch. And they always try to bring us on board to bring us into the NAACP or CORE or SNCC or, you know, things like that. But being raised by my grandfather, I didn't join groups. I just went out and I did my work. And the work that I did, I did with my two roommates and then three more coming on, like, you know, you know by ourselves, you know, with the substances that were thrown in our faces, literally, from uh, a Dixie cup from time to time when we were going out to the field, bodily fluids and your other, like your things. I didn't let that get in the way because I knew what I was after and I knew who I was. But the situation was I never marched in any of the demonstrations. You know, with uh, Mr. John Lewis, you know, I talked with John a, a long time, you know, years ago. And I was telling him that, you know, my grandfather had always taught me, if someone hits you, I would be very disappointed at you if you did not hit them back. Even if you have to run after you hit them back, you defend yourself. <clears throat> always defend yourself. And <clears throat> that was not the very stylish thing then when everyone was talking about nonviolence. Stuff like your dad, I was not a fan of Dr. King's even though I knew him well and respected him and respected the work that he did. But I don't think that, uh, you know, John Lewis, Mr. Lewis, I feel like me very much because in a conversation, you know, once we were talking and he was saying something about sports and, and it was sort of like, well, you were playing ball. And I said, yeah, but John, you were famous for getting beat up. I never became famous for getting beat up. And I don't want to apologize for that today. I didn't get beat up back, you know, back during that time. And I'm not going to get beat up today by anybody uh, by, uh, either. Even at 74 years old, that is not going to happen you know, to me. But you know, there were the death threats that we went through. And uh, you know, we you know, played in all the games. I know that I, I know that I excelled. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been uh, drafted in the position that I was drafted uh, by in the National Football League. And we had some bigotry in the National Football League when I went in there. You know, even because all of the teams would keep an even number. We only kept 40 players on a the squad then. And, uh, we didn't have nearly as many teams as we had today. They would always keep an even number of blacks so that you the blacks could room together. I think that the first uh, and a couple uh, black white uh, your team that uh, roomed together was my college teammate Brian Piccolo and my good friend Gail Sears from Chicago, but that was a very extraordinary situation when they became roommates there. It wasn't happening in any place else in the league. So a lot of the attitudes that existed in this South and in college existed there too. When I was a young man, one of the things that my grandfather, you know, my grandpa, uh, you know, taught me, you cannot force a person who does not like you to like you. But you can cause a person who does not like you to respect you based on how you live, 
how you carry yourself, what kind of work you do. I'll give you another quick story, and uh, then there's a few things I wanted to cover about today's players. Uh, and I told you this here once before, when I was a very little kid over in North Carolina, probably maybe six years old, I went to, to a uh, the bus station, which was segregated, had a white side to the bus station and a black side. The black side for the uh, bus station was uh, one small little room with mm, very uncomfortable chairs, very comfortable chairs on the white side. If you wanted something from the concession stand on the, and you were colored, which is what we were called then, um, we would go up to a little cubby hole that was cut out in the wall and you would tell the man who was on the other side of the cubby hole what you wanted. If it was a magazine or a comic book, at that time, you couldn't touch the comic book to look at it before you paid, uh, or un until you had paid. You paid, and then if you touched it and you were black, you could not give it back. In regards to food or anything like that, they would just pass that through to you through the little cubbyhole. So I think that I was around six years old and I was there, you know, with an aunt. And uh, one of my favorite things was grape drink. Me, I grape drinks, soft drinks. And uh, I asked her if I could uh, have a big grape, a big grape drink. And uh, she said, yes. So a huge drink cost five cents. And uh, the bus station was the only place or the, uh, the pharmacy, uh, you know, the drugstore where they had a little canteens, you could sit down if you were white and you could eat there, but you had to go to the back door if you were black and you had to eat whatever you were going to eat in the uh, parking lot out back. So uh, she gave me uh, my nickel and I went up to the cubby hole and I asked the man, he says, what do you want? I says, uh, I'd, I'd like a big grape drink, please. And uh, he says, you, you have any money? And I said, yes, sir. So I took my nickel and I put it on the counter and I slid it up, I had to reach up. Uh, when he came back with the drink, he accidentally turned the drink over and spilled almost half of it before he could uh, turn the, the cup upright. So he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. I'm a little six-year-old kid. I'm I don't know what to say. And he says, go, go ahead, take your drink, go ahead. So I said to him, I, I said, you you, you, you spilled, spilled my drink. He says, you little nigger, take that drink and get on out of here. So I took the drink and I went back. I was sitting on this hard old wooden bench with uh, you know, my aunt, uh, who was actually, who actually became a sister because my grandparents adopted me. But uh, I was crying. And uh, she says, what's wrong with you? You know, you wanted a drink. I got your drink. Now, what's wrong? So I says, uh, that white man spilled most, most of my drink. He poured most of it out. She says, well, he gave you the rest of it, didn't he? Filled it back up. I said, no. So she took that cup, which was a very dangerous thing for her to do. And she went back to the window there. And boy, she was raising her voice and yelling at him, which you couldn't do when you were colored at that time. And she's saying, you know, you spilled his drink and he paid you for it. You, know, you filled this cup back up. You give him what he paid for. So the guy kind of laughed a little bit. and He filled the cup back up, gave it like yo to it. And as we were walking away, he says like, yo, ah, damn niggers. And, uh, I went back. I had, so I had my I had my your know, drink go there. A lot of years later, I'm twenty some years old and I'm playing for the Baltimore Colts. I uh, was back there to see my grandparents, and I went over to the bus station because a friend of uh, mine that I'd gone to high school with by that time in oh sixty nine or sixty eight or sixty nine was in charge of the uh, baggage at the bus station. And when I say bus station, 
there was a lot of traffic, bus traffic there because we had 100, 120 to 150,000 Marines uh, at all times stationed on base at Camp Lejeune at that time. So their travel back and forth, you know, buses ran 24 hours like your day. And then you had the regular people in the city and the county there like you as well. So the bus station was a big deal. A friend of mine uh, was the um, <coughs> manager at that time of loading luggage onto the bus when people like you were leaving. So I went by to see him and uh, he came over and he says, like, yo, Bob, he says, oh, man, he says, uh, do you have a do you have any pictures that you could sign? So I says, uh, yeah. I said, I, I have a few in the car. I said, what do you, what do you need? Like, he said, well, yeah, I like when he said, but he says, your, your biggest fan is here. He said, this man is the, you know, the, yeah, he said, I guarantee you, he's the biggest fan you, you have anywhere in the United States. So I said, really? He says, yo, he sneaked in and watched you play all of your high school games. He came to some of your college games. He says, and in his office here, he says, he's the manager of the bus station now. And in his uh, office, Yeah, I knew that was coming. Okay. He says, in his office, he says, he has three of his walls is covered with nothing but articles and pictures about you from the time you were in high school all the way up to today. He says he gets newspapers from Baltimore everywhere. So I says, oh, okay. So we got the pictures and we went in and uh, there was no one in there. So he says, let, let me go and get it for you. So he went and he, he came back with this, this man and I'm looking at the man when he walks in, tall, slender, you know, man, it was the same man that has spilled my drink when I was six years old and called me a nigger, mm. a little nigger. He ran over to me, gave me a big hug, and all three of his walls were covered. It was just stuff by me. I thought, this is insane. Ran over to me, gave me a big hug. Bob, I'm so glad that you came by to see me. You're like your son. I never had a chance like you to meet you, but I, I'm just I've been a big fan like of yours and boys. I yeah, I saw you when you when you played against Carolina and you guys beat like your them and you picked that boy up over your head like he was a little baby and body slammed him like he was a professional wrestler. And uh, so I'm looking at him and I'm trying to make like your sure and sure enough. It was the same man. And I thought to myself, should I tell him who I am and that I was that little kid and what he did? And I thought about it for a while while he was like, you're talking. And I thought, he's not the same man. You know, he, he has changed. Uh, he was one person many, many years ago, et cetera. But that's not who he is like anymore. So I never brought it up you know, to him. But any time that I was in town there, if I were to see my, my grandparents, if I was there for more than 25, 24 hours, he would know some kind of way. That he'd, uh, he'd, be, he'd make a call to my uh, you know, grandparents, like, you awesome. Bob, come down here or oh, let me buy you lunch, son. You know, come, don't come in here without seeing me. You know how much I care about you. People change. And I learned that a long time, you know, before I killed that. Another traumatic experience that I had when I was, uh, I think about six or seven years, thank you also. Uh, we went to a grocery store there. And, uh, you know, we, we, you could not go inside if you were colored unless you were going to buy some groceries, if you wanted a soft drink or something like that, you we had to go to the back door. And the store was Kellum Brothers' store. Uh, so they had meats and seafood and lots of canned goods, kind of like a general store there. So uh, I was with my grandpa one day. We had left the barbershop, and we uh, 
we're going by Kellen Brothers uh, General Store. And uh, I asked my grandpa, I said, yo, grandpa, can I have a, and you know what, Cap? Can I have a, can I have a knee eye grape drink? And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that we can arrange that. So we went around to the back door, Kellen Brothers, and uh, I, we knocked on the door and somebody came back and he says, uh, the teenage boy that was sitting there, yo, yeah, yo, what, what do you want? So my grandpa says, yo, uh, yo, give us a Coca Cola and a, one of those big knee high grape drinks. So they brought it back out and another man brought it back, brought the two drinks, thank you out. So uh, there was a little thing on the back door there which you could open it yourself. So before the uh, man who gave us the drinks you know, left, he uh, you know, says, uh, now don't take my bottles with you. You, know, you can put my bottles in that barrel like over there before you leave in that bottle barrel. So said, okay, all right. So we sat there and we were drinking our drinks. And first came an old black man who was, who was probably, well, maybe in his very late 60s or 70s then, wasn't very large, small in statue, he and his wife. So he had on uh, one of the roller flat things, he had a few bags of grocery, and he rolled that up to an old rusted out uh, pickup truck that uh, that he had uh, you know, there, and he was taking the bags of groceries off and putting them in the back of their pickup truck and his wife got in the truck. A white lady who was probably in her late twenties came out and she was rolling her thing, uh, her, her flat, and she had a, maybe two bags on there. So when she reached her car, she yelled over to this old man. She says, she go, Hey boy, come over here and, and put my put my groceries in my car. So he looked up and he says, uh, uh, "You know, yes, ma'am. Let me finish. Yes, let me finish putting my wife's your know, things like in my truck." And so the white lady, it's the first time I'd ever heard that word, says, "Don't you sass me, nigger. You get over here and you put this stuff in my put these bags in my car." And uh, so he said, "Yes, ma'am," but he kept putting the bags in the back of his pickup truck. So she like yo yelled at him and you know, you know called him a <laughs> nigger a few times and et cetera and told him to get his ass over there. And about that time there were a group of maybe four you know or more young white men came. They were probably in their late teens or whatever. They said to her, because she was young and screaming, you know, what's the matter? What's the matter? And uh, she says, that old nigga sassed me. So I'm standing there with my grandfather. And uh, they went over and they just started beating this old man to a pulp. He was down on the ground you know, bleeding through his, out of his mouth and nose, and they were still kicking him. His wife was in the car. She was screaming with her hand over her mouth. There were other people who were looking and stuff like you too. And I'm like, you know, wondering to my, my grandpa, I'm thinking, Grandpa, why don't you go, why don't you go and, you, why don't you go and help him? And I don't know what I was going to do. Like, I, I kind of took a took a step forward and I was about to say, stop, stop. Uh, and my grand, my grandpa put his hand on my shoulder and he says, no, don't move, don't move. You'll just, just be quiet, just, just stay right here. I said, grandma, but they're killing that man. He says, no, he says, he says, you know, that's, that, that's the way it is now. He said, but by the time you're a grown man, I don't believe it's going to be that way. I believe that it's going to change. Those were two experiences that I had there like you know, earlier, Carolyn. So when someone you know, tells me about uh, uh, the racial divide, even like you know, today with 
the madness that's going on. I've lived through this and I've seen it. I can tell you this before I go into the thing over with. Uh, I believe that it was President James Madison said, and I'm paraphrasing here, it is wrong for the government or any man to take the fruits of one man's labor and give those, give that to another man. Uh, now we can say food or we can say your money. I am not a socialist. Uh, my wife and I, we give to charities every year. I always have. We do work for charities. I think that most good Americans, whether they're liberal or conservative, do give to charities, whether it's just a church or it used to be the March or Dimes or the Shriners, uh, or maybe even someone on the street who could use a quarter would help them or a dollar would help them. I think that most Americans think you'll do that. But in socialism, uh, and growing up, one of the things that I learned from my grandfather, I was asking him once on you know, what a communist like you know was. And you know, he explained to me that a communist is what uh, some of the people uh, in China and some of the people in Russia and some other places like your work. So I asked him, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, what that means is it doesn't matter how much work you do, the government, they come and they take some of what most of what you've got and they leave you what they think you should have and then they divide the rest of your money up among everyone else. And uh, I said, that that doesn't sound right to me. And he explained to me, he says, well, he says, with those people, he says, they've been trying to recruit black people. And he fought in World, he fought in world War I. They've been trying to recruit and kill black people. He says, Dr. Martin Luther King was a really good man. And Mr. Paul Robeson was a really good man. And he says, but they entertained you know, them back during the day. And both of those great men saw their way around out of that. And they went in another direction. And he told me, he says, now they uh, call it. And we were, were reading George Orwell's 1984 when we were talking about that. And he told me, he said, you know, we had perfect socialism in this country at one time, complete and total, more complete than in the communist countries. And I says, no, we didn't. You know, he says, no, we did. He says, because when one man does the work and then someone else takes all the money from their work and then spends it or divides that money up however he wants to and gives him some old ragged pants to wear and a little bit of food to eat and a beat up old cabin to live in, then that is perfect socialism. And he says, what's that called? I says, I, I don't know. He says, that is called slavery. He says, communism and socialism are kind of like slavery. It just has a shoe shine on it. So I always remember you know, that. There's no such thing as perfect capitalism and perfect you know, socialism. You know, we know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm looking today at what a lot of our young people are doing in the country. Now, with a lot of the young people, with all that is going on in the country today, some of this, these people are trying to relive live the 60s. Hey, hey, Bob, I'm going to stop you right there before you go on to your point. I want to make sure that everybody knows that when Bob goes, get, goes into his next salient points, that I am going to open up the phone lines. I see that there are comments and lots of positives. 
I would really appreciate it if you yourselves can call in and give give the the props to Mr. Grant because it's it's okay coming from me, but when we have Mike and Don out there doing all these things. Jason's out there as well, especially Mike and Don, who's been uh, commenting at, at, a, at a good spell. I'd like for you guys to at least be able to talk to Bob yourself. And that's one of the reasons why I like this new concept of the two viewerships along with a, a call-in period. So again, make sure, and I tell you, I know Mike. Mike's not, not shy. Don is probably not shy. Uh, Jason Dean might be. But uh, I'd, I'd definitely like for you to hear from them personally, Bob. And I, I just wanted to cut you right before you got to that point. I think I got you at a right at okay. a right juncture. Okay. But but go um, ahead. You you were about you were about ready to to bring it all back from what what you have experienced and what was I want to say the, uh, the norm and then the processing of the norm from your early childhood through your adulthood and now into now you said how we have uh you know slavery being and being a uh a, I want to say a subset of socialism and communism or the other way around but they're all it's all pretty much the same and we we, we I definitely can agree with that but you were also going to bring up the fact for modern day with the people for modern day and their points um and you can interrupt me anytime that you want. Uh, Yo, know, Cap, if, if anyone wants me to answer a question, I will you know, answer it as directly as I can. With well, yeah, young, I, I will. Okay. But, uh, with, with the young people that we have out there today, a lot of these people miss the 60s. And uh, they want to be a part of something like the 60s were. They read the books and they've seen the movies, and I'm just gonna like you tell you they quite watch most of the movies that I've seen, and with most of the books and the way that things that that what the things that were like you know, written, uh, there's a lot that's there's a lot that's lacking there. It's too late for you to relive you know the '60s. We live in a country that is an extraordinary country. We live in a country where as we are supposed to have free speech. You have to be kind of careful today if you're conservative, because if you go out on the street, we have some of those kids that are all dressed in black, you know, they'll beat you up or hurt you or like, you know, worse. Ever since we got here and we had civil war, in the police academies, policemen are human beings. You have a few bad, bad apples. Most of them are not bad apples, but you have some firemen that are bad apples. You have some doctors, if you read back down through history. I, I, I've seen movies on a couple of doctors who were serial killers. Uh, whether a person is white, brown, black, or whatever, each person is an individual. And as an individual, they have a mind that it's their own mind. They are not required to think the way that I want them to think or that you want them to think, Cap, or anyone else wants them like you to think because if they do that, if they allow me to dictate to them exactly what they should think and believe, then I have two lives, as my grandfather told me they get once, and they have the or none. I'm living mine and I'm living theirs as well. Now, in the country at this time, there's a fight for power. And I look at the way that the black community is being taken advantage of here now. 
by people who are going to desert them, I believe. Back during my day, there were the hippies. And the hippies were, oh, singing black music. Some of them could dance better than black people. I happen to be a black person who couldn't dance. But I tried. <laughs> uh, uh, and somewhere like you along the line, all the hippies disappeared. And they were hanging out with us. And they went back to school and college and law school and became school teachers and got married and became managers of this stores and everything. They just kind of deserted the black community from that time. With these people, and I'm just going to let you say, with all these white anarchists who have hijacked the black movement, which does have an argument, uh, a case to be made at this time, but the movement has been hijacked by an uh, uh, anarchists who are primarily interested in overthrowing the country. So they will wait for blacks to have a peaceful demonstration going on and they're protesting legitimately. I haven't heard anybody in either political party say that the people who are demonstrating peacefully don't have the right to do that. But you do not have the right to burn my store down, whether I'm black or white, when I have my life savings invested in that. You don't have the right to kill me just because you're angry with you know, my political beliefs or just because my skin is white. A policeman doesn't have the right to kill a black person just because their skin is black. And I'm going to address the police situation before we get out of here, uh, before we uh, get uh, through this deal you know, today. People have lost control and they are being sucked in to this power play. If you go back and you study, you will find that the Communist Party, and I'm just talking as a black you know, man here, here right now, the Communist Party, uh, all the way back to Paul Robeson's time, all the way back uh, to the time when a number of blacks in this country were looking at it because they were being treated like you so badly. They stated that the way to conquer America would be through a racial divide. They knew that they were never going like, to conquer the United States with missiles or with uh, war. If they had thought that they were going to be able to do that, they would have started a war. They would have gone and did that years like you know, before. But I fear that through some of the people that we, a lot of us don't see exactly who they are and what they are afterwards, I believe that they may have found some allies. And for the first time in my life, I'm looking you know, now, and I believe that a minor race war, to some degree, is possible. With Dr. King, the progress that we've made you know, so far in everything, we didn't make that progress by killing your know, other like your people. If they think that these policemen today are bad, well, they should go all the way back to the time of... Uh, you know, Governor Wallace and Governor uh, Maddox and, uh, you know, Mr. Strom Thurmond, uh, uh, George Wallace, and a lot of other people, you know, George Lincoln Rockwell, whom I had a direct confrontation with in 64, 68. Uh, and, and I think you can find that on the internet, you know, you know at Wake Forest. Uh, the we're going to have to be very careful here. And I would say to like, you know, the young black people who are out there, those white people that are running around out there with those black bandanas and stuff, they're going to desert you. And they're going to leave you out there by yourself. And uh, they're going to just disappear the same way 
that the hippies disappeared on us you know, years, like, you know, before. Now, before anybody, like, you know, says that, uh, well, you're an Uncle Tom, you know, your police are killing, like, your know, people. I like to talk, like, you know, facts. We have two problems that are going on in regards to Black life in this in this country right now. Someone crafted the phrase, Black Lives Matter, and they didn't finish it. And because they did not finish it, and I think that it was done intentionally, they put a lot of white people on the defensive. The complete sentence should have been, Black Lives Matter too, or Black Lives Matter also, or Black Lives Matter as much as White Lives Matter. But leaving it isolated and incomplete alienated a big part of our population here. And then you have a statement on one side, and let's say the statement stands alone, and that statement is Black Lives Matter. And then on the other side, somebody comes up with an organization and they name that Black Lives, that organization, Black Lives Matter. Those two things are different. The statement is not the same as the organization. The organization is not operating with the same things in mind that some older person who supports Black Lives Matter too out of the church. They are not supporting the same thing. But if you listen to the media, they group the things together enough, 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 so that you think that they are one and the same. We have a lot of black people in this country who don't believe in violence. A uh, long time back, uh, you know, wise American, you know, man, a lot of people may not like it. Mr. Elijah Muhammad says he did not want any of his followers carrying guns around or any other weapon because they were running around out there with paper cap pistols and pop guns trying to go up against a government that has tanks, rockets, and atomic bombs. That is a losing proposition. Mm -hmm. The answer was, and the answer always has been, dialogue. Uh, very, very few wars are ever just flat out won by anyone. At some point, people have to come to the table to sit down to work the peace out, to negotiate a peace. That takes dialogue in order to do that. We have people in this country who are capable of doing that. But they have to remove their egos and they have to remove politics from it for that kind of conversation to take place. Before I move on to our athletes, I would say, you know, this. Cap, can you tell me who the leader of Chinese Americans are in this country? The Chinese American leader. Who, yeah, who is who, who is their leader in America? Uh, Bob, I couldn't tell you. Oh, I couldn't either. Do the uh, Korean American people in this country? Uh, could you tell me their leader's name? Um, probably some gentleman with the last name of Park. But other than that, I couldn't tell you. And that's not that's not being facetious because most 
of the American Koreans that I know of are named Park. So I wasn't trying to make a, a blatant <laughs> joke, but I would say that's a good good guess. But but the answer to that is not. It, they don't have one. Do the do the Jewish people have a personality, a leader that they march out front here in uh, America? Um, no, no. no, how, about, no how, about the, how about the Armenians? The Armenians? No, One, no. Why is it, Cap, that somebody is always trying to give the black people a leader? Other people don't need a leader. We always need a leader, a personality. So they start to judge all of us by that person's your personality. There are some good men, but right. we, we have lots of smart people in our community. And we can speak by community, by committee, and we can speak you know, for ourselves. If I see one more person that can march out there and they say, oh, this is the leader for the black people and everything, and he's speaking for the black people, I think I'm going to throw him if I see a margin. One more person out there like that. Uh, whether someone is liberal or whether they're conservative or whether they're like you're independent, they should be intelligent enough to think for whomever they want to think for. And from time to time, we may lean right and at other times we may lean right. Uh, but we should be intelligent about what we do. That's what whites and everyone else like you does. Uh, well, that's what they do. They'll lean right sometimes and they will lean left sometimes. And for one political party to think that they own us and then if we don't vote the way that they want us to vote, the way that the old masters did, right after slavery and we had to stay on as sharecroppers and so and uh, they cast a vote for us before we were even able to vote and for someone to tell me that if you don't vote for me you're not black then i, I don't think that person understands the intelligence of many black people you know, in this like your country and i'm not saying that anyone should not vote to the left this time. I'm not saying that anyone should not vote to the right. I'm only saying that they should think for themselves and look at the facts. If you have a quarterback in the game and the quarterback is winning, uh, you might want to look at not taking him out. Now, if you decide that you want to take him out of the game and you're winning the championship game, then if you feel this best to take him out of the game while you're winning, you know, then you, you go ahead and take him out. But if you look and you say, we're winning with this guy, I think I'm going to vote to lead him in, then you vote to lead him in. That is a choice that we have as Americans. I am not upset or angry with anyone, regardless of which way they vote you know, here. But if you have any questions I can ask like you're not, then I want to address what our black athletes can really do if they want to be a part of the solution here today. Uh, if you have any questions before I move on to that, I'm open to discussion. Well, no, I wanted, I wanted to interject some of the comments. Okay. Um, and again, so, some of these... This one is facetious, but it's beautiful. Uh, the leader of the Philippine, the Filipinos for the Americans is uh, is Pat. I think that would be Pacquiao, and I and I know that Don <laughs> Webb, Don Webb, Don Webb is married to a a, a Philippine a Philippine uh, uh, wife. So that's that's the leader. So and actually, uh, Pacquiao is actually a congressman. In the Philippines, oh, so he's the, yes. boxer, the boxer, the great boxer, also. right, right, the great boxer, <laughs> and he is, you know, Philippine Americans. They definitely associate with with Pacquiao. Um, <laughs> and, and, and Don said, uh, and again, 
uh, Doc, Dr. Soul, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, Senator Scott, Colonel West, Dr. Carson, uh, Joe Morgan, Shaquille O'Neal, Charles Barkley are all my heroes, and he's being real. So there, there you go for some of his some of his uh, heroes uh, at, that are that are Black Americans. So and again, Don Don's good people, and Don will Don will definitely interject, but uh, he comes in with a lot of a lot of good comments, and these are fantastic comments, Don. And and like I said, uh, Mike, hopefully we'll get you guys to actually uh, express that through a call because I know that uh, Bob Grant would definitely like it. So now, Bob, the floor is yours. As we as we discovered, no, I, I'd have to look up for the like I said the uh, the Korean leader, but uh, Dollars to Donuts, his name is probably Park. <laughs> okay, the um, as far as our athletes, uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of athletes that do a lot of good, you know, with our money. You know, we only hear about them when one gets into a little trouble. A lot of these young men are good young men. A funny thing is this, and I offer this reward and I'll only give one away, you know, Captain Jack. In this country, of young black to, as a lead into where we're, where I'm going to discuss. In this country, in sports, we have approximately three or four thousand young black men or black men under thirty who are millionaires. The question is, and if someone can name another country for me, Cap, Cap, I will send you $100 sent to him. Is there another country on the face of the earth, including the African nations, that you can go to and find three to 4,000 millionaires, black millionaires, that are under 30 years old. I don't I'd think. I venture to say no. I don't think that there is one. Now, someone may earn that your $100. I want proof. But I don't think that there's another like your country. So let's look at our athletes and let's look at just how powerful they are. There is an old saying, and I hope that I won't get in trouble for saying this. Money talks and bullshit walks. In Bob, this the, way, the, way, the way I swear, trust me, that is probably one of the least swear words you'll ever hear on my channel. You know, so <laughs> trust me, that's that's just that's way down on, on the lower list or something <laughs> that they're gonna hear on my channel. So no worries <laughs> on that one. <laughs> In, in order to live and prosper in America, the things that we need, and somebody's going to say, oh, well, we need shelter, and we need to say that in this order, which is what I teach young kids in my, when I am working in the inner city schools and teaching the literacy classes that I've been teaching for a couple of days a week for oh, close to 20 years now here in Los Angeles. The number one thing that we need to survive and be happy here in America is oxygen, air. Take once take someone's oxygen from them, and they're not going to be very happy very long because they're going to be gone in a matter of minutes. The next thing that we absolutely need, number two, would be water. We can go for a while without water, but we can't go for weeks and weeks without it. The next thing that we would need, number three, would be food. Uh, we can go longer without food than we can go without water. And of course, we need relationships and shelter, but if you've got money, the next most important thing that you need 
if you are to enjoy life on this planet in America, is money. You need money to get food in this country like you're primarily. You need money to get shelter like you're here. You need money to get the things for your loved ones that you need. You need money to help your churches if you're out. You need money to give to like your the different charities. Uh, you need money to get a car to get to work. You need money to send your help your grandkids out who are in college and go to school. So it would be water, so it would be oxygen, water, food, and money. Money equates as power. If you don't have money in this country, you can demonstrate all you want to. You can do whatever you like you want. At some point in time, they're going to shut you down. They are going to come and get you. Uh, and it doesn't matter who's in office, Republican or Democrat. If you get too crazy, they will not let you overthrow the nation. They will come and get you. And they will kill you. And all those kids that are out there in those white bandanas and I mean, those black bandanas and stuff now, they're going to run away and go back home to mom and daddy. Uh, but black, our black athletes, I'm going to just, and I think I, I won't be too far off on any of these numbers here. In the United States of America, we, we have somewhere between 35 and, and, and 39 million black people today. Out of, they say, you know, 300, they say 340, like you're so, with the illegals who are here, we really have, like, you know, 360 you know, or, or, or more. I would say, let's say we have approximately 35 million Black people, like, you know, here. Most people don't know that of the 35 million Black people that we have in this country, we earn approximately $1.5 trillion per year. That's $1.5 trillion. If you break that down, that would be around $43,000 earned for each Black person, man, woman, child, baby, in America. If, if we could get together and set aside 5%, one nickel out of each dollar, keep 95 cents, and set aside collectively, five cents, a nickel out of each dollar. At the end of a year, we would have right in the neighborhood of $75 billion. I didn't say million, $75 billion. Every year that we did that, we would have an additional $75 billion. Well, what can you do with $75 billion leveraging it? I could go to any bank or any, they, 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 they bend over backwards, any of them. If I would say, I'm going to say, we're going to deposit a lot of this money in here with like, you guys. We could purchase putting 20, 25% down. We could purchase $225 billion in real estate every year. $225 billion every year, which means we could actually just buy up some cities or some big parts of some cities. Instead of going out there with these crazy Antifa people 
and burning things like you're down. Let's buy the neighborhood instead of burning that neighborhood down. As far as that is concerned with that kind of money, we can go downtown and buy two or three skyscrapers every year. And of course, we're not as mean as people have made us sound through like the years. We would be good if you're landlords, lords. We would rent to anyone. We would rent to white, black, Asian, uh, Latinos. We would rent to anyone. Um, but we would first of all have to be willing collectively to set aside one nickel out of each dollar that we all make every year. Now let's get to our black athletes because everybody knows you can't get you know 35 million people to do hardly you know, anything. You, you can't get them to agree on anything. But let's look at our athletes. And you know, these figures are gonna be really, really like you know, close. I don't think that I'm gonna be like you're too far off. In the NFL, every year we have uh, approximately 1,500 black ball players. The median salary, you know, there is $900,000 per year for each man. That's the median salary. Now, of course, a lot of them make a lot more. You know that. Right. You know, some of them make four or five million. Some of them make 15, 20 million. So in the NFL, the total amount that goes to the black players in salaries is $1.4 billion. If They would just set aside, if they could get together and not worry about who was going to get credit for it, not worry about like your leaders, 10% of what each one of them makes out of the NFL players, they, they've, from the NFL players, they would be setting aside $140 million dollars per year in the nba they make a little more money now there are uh, approximately 600 or so black players in the nba the median salary in the nba is uh i, I think uh, like one one point three million dollars per man now, of course, we know that you know, some of them make a lot, a lot more than that. But the and, that's media, just their, and that's just their contracts. That's not including their endorsements. That is correct. $1.3 million per year. And, I, and I'll capsulize this real for everyone because this isn't about politics. Uh, but I'm sharing this to just show what our athletes from these two le leagues could do. If they really got to your series, the so the total uh, salaries for uh, black NBA players would come to about seven hundred and eighty million dollars per year. If they set aside uh, ten percent, that would give them 78 million. If those two groups got together and we and they put took 10%, 90000 dollars or so off of the median salary, and it would still be their money. And they said we're going to become our own group and we're going to start fighting for justice. And we're going to start speaking up. Combined, the black players in both leagues, the median salary is $218 million 
per year, or one quarter of a billion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. With that kind of money, forget this marching and burning stuff like, you know, down. And I'm going to address the police before we leave here. Let's forget about like you're dead. Let's open our own office in Washington, being a billion dollar company, buying billion dollars like you in property. Rents are expensive in Washington, but they're not that expensive. Let's hire some really, really good lawyers who are truly committed to fairness. Well, see, that, see, see, Bob. There, there. See, not now. You're talking. Now you're talking pure science fiction with lawyers that are truly going to help and care. Okay, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I have to interject there. That's. That's all. Okay, that's a joke. But you know what? You know where I'm going there. No, I. I understand. I understand what you're saying. But you got to find them, and you once you find yeah. them, we'll go for that. There you go. Yeah, I. I, I believe. I believe that in America, as many good attorneys, I mean, you can make them all black if you want to, I don't care, but as many good attorneys as we had, if they got on board with the program mm -hmm. and they were paid well, we have enough money to pay them like you're well, I believe that we could find some who would come on board. Now, with that kind of money, and our own office for lobbying in Washington. If we want to see any congressman, any senator, I guarantee you they will see us. If we oh, want yeah. to with that kind of money. If we want to see, if we want an audience with any governor, I guarantee you with that kind of power, when we're buying up real estate in his state, I guarantee you he will see us. Any mm -hmm. mayor will bend over backwards, backwards to see us and talk with us and accommodate us if we have that kind of money. And if we're coming with real power, because real power in this country and in the world, whether you're in China or Russia or whatever, is green power. Well, ours is green. Maybe other colors in other like your countries. It's not black power, it's not white power, it's not Jewish power, it's not Armenian power, it's not Chinese power, it's green power. I'm sure that you have all heard that other old saying, he who has the gold makes the rules. It's true. I'm telling you, it is absolutely true. We have to come to understand that our black athletes have real power right now if they will use it a lot of them and i don't criticize how anybody spends his money or which political party he gives it his money i kill too but that's just not going to give you there that's not going to get you there rather you have to control your own destiny in this like your country. Uh, if you want more black people to be employed, then start more black businesses and stop begging white people to hire you. If there's somebody who doesn't like you and they don't want to invite you to the 4th of July barbecue, as my grandpa <laughs> would tell me, don't you worry about that. You have your own barbecue there and you invite them and any other good, sane person that wants to come. What you're going to find once you start operating that way is just that there's just as there's some good people of all different colors, there's some bad people of all different colors. Now, you'll finally what I would like to address and at the retired players like your Congress, we have met with Los Angeles like your police department. 
I don't tell them what Lake Hill to do. We've spoken forthrightly to them. They've spoken forthrightly to us. This is not the time or place to share Lake Hill that. But I will tell you this. When we look at the police department, no, let me say it. Let me say it this way. Not police. When we look at the, in case <laughs> we have a lot of my younger brothers like you on the streets, and I've, I've been in Cabrini Green, Chicago. In my younger years, I spent time out there like you on the street. You know, I mean, I'm you know, hoping there's not a hell because you know, I have no chance of my getting into heaven here you know, with my younger life. But, um, I look, and you know, right now, we have some policemen who are killing some blacks. They're killing some whites too, but I'm not going to get into that. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're killing a lot more whites. They would have to because there are a lot more whites in the population. But yes, there are some who are killing. And I presented this to one of the top commanders with LAPD, and he had to agree. I'm looking at some black people being killed by police each year, some wrongly, some because they're shooting back, and they've broken the law. I'm not siding. I'm not siding with anyone. What you have to realize is when it comes to policemen, we have some guys who get on the police force because it is a great job. And if you can get, you can make some very good money. And if you can last long enough, you'll get a really good pension. The last thing that they want to do, some of them, is to do anything that's going to cause them to lose their pension and get them thrown off the force. That's some. We have some other, some fewer people on the police force who are stone cold mean people. They will bully anybody, white or black, that they run across. Mm -hmm. The ego gets in the way. Then we have another group of people who are on our police forces who are maybe probably racist, who for whatever reason don't like your black people. And they can hide behind that badge. They are there. Then we have some people on the police force for says, and this is really going to get me into trouble with some people, who are five foot three and weigh in at 135 pounds. You cannot be an effective policeman being that small at that weight in certain situations. I'm not saying black gangs or whatever, it could be motorcycle gangs, it could be a drunk, white, black or whatever, Somebody who just says, I got a warrant of this and I'm not going to jail. If you show up there and you stop that person and you're weighing a buck 35 and you're five foot like you're five and he decides that you're not taking him in, he's going to resist. You're either going to get your butt kicked or you're going to have to rely on that weapon. Right. And if they get to you quick enough, you better start running because you're not going to make you do it. So we have mm -hmm. some people, who, we have a number of people who don't belong on a police force. 
And you can be politically correct, you know, as much as you like your want, like your two, I don't care if it's a man or a woman or whatever. You need to be able to do the job without resorting to deadly force in instances that you don't have to resort to deadly force. Now, when a policeman says stop, right or wrong, any intelligent person is going to do the same thing that you're going to do when a mugger pulls a gun and puts it in your face and says, stop, give me your wallet. When someone says, like, you know, stop, and they've got a weapon, people, please stop. That's not the time or place to argue whether you are right or wrong. That's it. Argue when you get to court. Make sure that you come out of that situation alive because you may run into one of those few policemen who is a bigot if you are black. And they may take that opportunity to take you out with Many of the guys who go through their police training, a lot of those guys, they go through it and they get through it. I, no, I take that back. Some of the guys. Now, I, I can speak with some expertise here because as for as some martial arts training and some weight training to help people put on get put on, uh, put on more size and weight. Years ago, I trained some of the guys from that old LAPD crash unit. And those were some bad, bad cops. They were bad cops, whether you're white, black, brown, yellow, whatever, those guys were bad dudes, which is why they disbanded them and I think threw a lot of them off of the force like you're there. Mm -hmm. So I would talk with them and listen to them every day. There are some bad ones out there. When an officer says to you, stop, make your case in court. If you run across one of the ones who is a bigot, he's just waiting for an opportunity to shoot you. Now, you can run or reach inside your coat if you want to, like you, et cetera. And when he says, stop, stop, and you reach inside your car, like you, or whatever, you just gave him an excuse to light you up. You just gave, you, you made it possible for him to do it. You played a role in doing like you're that. And another thing, for those of you who have never been in a firefight or been around it, when one shot with most of the police department, as in the military, you're taught to fire in volleys of three, yo, bang, bang, bang. There's no such thing as you're trying to shoot this person in the leg try to shoot this person in the hand, like in the old cowboy movies, the arm. You fire center mass. You fire at the middle of that person's body. Because if you're going to fire, then it means that things are at a point where somebody's life is in danger or somebody's going to say that someone's life is in danger. So you can't just... The average policeman... It's not even a good enough marksman to shoot me in my hand if I've got a gun or a knife in my hand. They're not that good. Yeah, well, this, but, and this, ain't, this ain't Hollywood. No, like you said, no, this ain't Hollywood. Like you, like you said, Bob, and, and as a military member, and I know Don is a military member. We're all taught 
center mass because that that'll stop that'll give you that initial for to stop a, anybody and then if you want to get cute after that because you've stopped your target then you can maybe fire you know three three in the in the head but you know it again that's that we're talking about what reality is in hollywood when you're on the street you're looking at firing and, and and hitting them and the biggest thing you're going to fire at is whatever is in front of you center mass so yeah people people need to understand that that hollywood shit goes right out the window and when people with a gun i don't care if they're policemen if they are afraid already once they start shooting they're not going to shoot they're not going to fire one time and just stop. They're going to fire until that weapon is empty. And if they're afraid, and if you go back and you ask them, you're right after us, how many times did you fire it? They don't know. The only thing they know is they fired until the clip was like you're empty. So you don't want somebody that's afraid of you already to start like you're shooting because they're not going to take it or stop. Now, Having said like you're this, with our policemen, if we have policemen, we're working on this. If somebody wants to hijack the idea, steal the idea, please go ahead. If someone is a bad policeman, it's not just a one-time thing. You do not have to make your case against him they're on the street. Make your case in court. But this is what you can do if you feel like a policeman, even in a traffic stop, has been out of line. You can drive directly when you leave there. I have done it. I've done it. You can drive directly. Make sure you get his name, his badge number. You know about where he's at. I'll ask him, yo, where are you based? He's got to tell you. I have driven there to that precinct, told the desk sergeant, I have a complaint against one of their officers, and I want, it, want, it, want you to write it up. The desk sergeant inv invariably with that blue line. Well, who is it? What happens? Well, I want to write it up. I want someone to take a written statement and I want it to go in his jacket. Well, we don't you know. Tell me what it is. You can't like you'll do it. My next like your thing is obviously you are not going to like you'll help me. Who is the commander here? I will, well, I, well, wait, wait a minute. I will go all the way up to line. I want someone to take my statement of what this officer did wrong to me, even if it's just a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make my case for the courts, um, but I want it to go on his record. They've got to take my statement. They must put it in his jacket by law. Now, if you've got a bad guy, and he's doing this stuff all the time, his jacket is going to end up being as thick as an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at those guys at the end of each year. And those police departments in those cities are going to see a lawsuit coming. And uh, union or not, they may have to negotiate this with like, the union. If you got 50 or 60 com legitimate complaints in one year and you're like your jacket, uh, we're going to put you on probation. We're going to take you out of the field. Uh, if these things are really bad enough, racially motivated or sexually motivated or like your whatever, we're going to fire you. We'll let your union sue us. We're going to fire you. We're going to get somebody who can do the job. The average citizen can do that. 
you don't have to argue with that police officer. He says, stop, you stop. Driver's license, registration, here you are, young man. Well, you can't say young man because you guys are old enough. <laughs> here you are, officer. Here you are, sir. Young. Don't even bother to ask. Why did you stop? Because you have conversation going. I think you got. I think you're getting a call, uh, Bob. I, I, I just, I just, you know, uh, declined it. You know, you're just trying to make your case with the officer out there. Uh, take those steps, and some of the killings will be reduced. You all believe, but. We had over 8,000 murders of black people killing black people last year. People don't want us to talk about like your death, but it's a fact. You know, relative to uh, police killing people, it's, it, it's a small number. I wish that it was not. But we, with our gang members, et cetera, you go to some place like your Chicago, we have thousands of young black men killing other black men every week. Players, everybody, let's address that. That's the elephant in the room. Yeah. There are a ton a ton of that. That is self-genocide. That is one of the biggest problems that we have here right now, and nobody really wants to talk about it. Everybody's afraid to talk about it. The why? I don't know. I don't know exactly how to stop that, but we do have some reasons, and uh, we can talk with your know, people if they want to get in touch with us at uh, playerscomics.com. Gmail has our email screwed up you know, right now you know, for some reason, but it should be back up in a couple of days. You know, our website is uh, uh, playerscongress.com. And, and, and that's, that's right. And that's one thing I wanted, wanted to get you on there, Bob. Um, is and then that's a that's a pretty good stopping point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get a banner uh, so the people can uh, can contact you. And uh, if you have any questions for Bob Grant, I, while I get the uh, email address up for playerscongress.com, go ahead and I'm going to start the banner here. And well, let's see here. There we go. Oh, uh, I should have I should have changed the title to the show, and I apologize. But uh, the the phone number is correct eight one three six nine nine zero eight three four. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get that for a new banner. Cap, can I make can I inject one thing? Yes, sir. What I'm talking about. Not, no one, don't get in touch with me over the. You know, that's going to be what it is. I'm talking about solutions. And I'm talking about the role that black athletes can play in the way of real, genuine solutions. And instead of the owners of these teams caving in and giving money. Two, these are the causes. Let's put some money into some, some causes that are not to deal with real solutions. I'm just talking about the real solutions. So while I'm Uncle Bob, please, if anybody have a name for Uncle Tom, don't. Just call me. That'll be just like, you know, fine. Uh, speak, whether you are liberal or conservative, um, support your right to vote for whomever you want, whether you are liberal 
or conservative, but I am very, very concerned about blowing into a system that we cannot win. Okay, and, and again, Bob, check check your uh, your microphone. You get, um, you know, I know my mic went down. I didn't touch anything. I'm trying to turn my volume back up, and it's not letting me do anything. Okay. So, we'll talk another time. Okay. Well, what I want to do is, is if there is anybody that is out there in the uh, the comment section, if they want to, if they want to talk to Bob, let me know now. If not, then we will we will probably uh, move to uh, to end the conversation. But this is a great conversation, and I know that Bob will come back at another time as well because he's already told me that he's amenable to that. Yes, as a matter of fact, when we come back, like you know, again, as as best I can. I mean, I'm not looking to be any leader of any of your thing. I'm seventy four years old. Like I'm really tired of this position, chairman. Uh, but I'm still on the job. But I'm going to contribute. But if you have me back, you'll get out and answer any questions. Okay, and what I'm going to do is while we're waiting, is I'm going to make another banner and I'm going to make sure that the. Uh, the, uh, the the website is Retired Players Congress, or is it playerscongress.com? Yep, just playerscongress.com. Okay, let me let me do that here. I gotta I gotta move my ship's wheel. Hate to do that. The ship is oh, okay, okay. That's, that is the web, that is the website. And if they want to write us directly, it's real simple. Players Congress at playerscongress.com. Okay, I'll do that. Hang on. Okay, and I th think we might be getting we might be getting a call. Yep, we are. Hang on a second there. Okay, uh, Bob, this is uh, this is Jason Dean Hunter, who is one of our regulars here. Jason Dean, go ahead and talk to Bob. Hello, Mr. Grant. How are you doing tonight? I, I'm fine. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but I'm fine. Okay, it's an honor to listen to your story. And that's, it's, it's amazing what you've overcome in your life. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple things. Um, of course, you know, football, you played at Wake Forest. Did you play Notre Dame at all when you were in college? No, sir. Thank goodness we didn't with the team that we had. Jason. You know, I have another question. I see that you are. Uh, you play for the Washington Redskins. What do you think about this name change? And what do you think is your opinion of what the name should be going forward? Well, with me personally, I mean, the people who patronize the team and the owner of the team have made that decision. That decision. Uh, Cap, I'm walking around. I'm going to try to plug in to see if I can make my speaker. Okay, okay, Bob. But um, but I can hear with the uh, I, uh, I I don't really have like an opinion on it. It's not my team. I don't own it. You know, Daniel Snyder owns the team, and uh, since he owns the team, I think that it's up to him and the league. And I, I don't care about the other people like this. The Redskins didn't bother to kill me, but. If it bothers some people, 
I, I guess it just did. Jason, you got anything else there? And I, I do appreciate you calling in. No, I just wanted to hear what, like, what he thought about those couple things. Yeah. Um. One more thing. Uh, you played for the Baltimore Colts, correct? Yes, sir. Oh, right. Yes, sir. Because yeah, I was looking up some uh, history on you. Like you were a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is, Bob. Uh, Bob hey, hey well, I'll tell you this, thank you, Jason. Had I not punched the coach in the face, I think that I would have played a lot longer than I did. But, but we'll, we'll talk about that one next time. Hey, J Jace, did you hear that? That uh, it Because I'm not sure if it got out there correct, uh, because the, the volume was a little bit bad. Bob said if he hadn't have punched the coach in the face, he probably would have played a lot longer in the NFL for sure uh, had he not done that. It, Mr. Grant, he probably deserved. It. Oh, he did. He did. Bob and I have already. Bob and I have already. Uh, he's already told me that story, and uh, yeah, he de he definitely deserved this. And like you said, and and Bob, I hope you can hear me. Like I said, Jason was saying that you are one bad man, and that's definitively some some positives your way. And no, uh, uh, what is it? No, ba no backing off on that because I agree as well. What you might want to look at, um, Jason, as well is is the famous. Uh, it's is it the Mongo the Mongo pose that you said, Bob? Bad uh, bad Mongo or big Mongo? What was the uh, the the karate pose that you had for for the Colts that you had in that one picture? Oh, uh, <laughs> magazine they could hear. You know they did an article on me when uh, I was teaching martial arts uh, during you know, that time and. Uh, well, they used to, the guys at Washington used to refer to me as Mr. Moto. Moto, Mr. Moto go. was a one. Right, Mr. Moto. That was it. And, it. and that's a badass pose, too, Bob. I will definitely have to check that out. But yeah, I'll get off the LCAP. Let somebody else call in and talk to Mr. Grant. Um, like I said, it was an honor hearing your story. It's amazing. Um, I donated to the Con Players Congress fund already. And it was great. I, I love my shirt. It's awesome. When football was really football, people used to hit. Now you just got to touch people and they get in trouble. So I'll go now. Captain, thanks for letting me call. I appreciate it. You guys have a great night. Hey, Jason, thanks for calling in. Uh, much appreciated. No problem. Good night, Mr. Grant. All right, uh, Bob. Uh, we I'm going to see if there's anybody else in the uh, uh, in the thing. Oh, and, and uh, Asylum said um, at least he didn't choke his coach. So, it, it, you, uh, and like I said, there, Bob. It, it, if you if you choked him, then things probably would have been a little bit different, and uh, the story would have been uh, different. And we don't want you to. Uh, have saying that we are we are presently uh calling bob grant from his uh you know a cell in uh wherever you know who's serving you know life and whatnot and i obviously i say that i say that tongue in cheek but you know things worked out for you and uh retired uh players congress uh wouldn't have gotten the great leader that they have there and i do have it on the bottom of the screen um i'm not sure if you can see it but it is Players Congress at playerscongress.com uh, immediately, if I'm not mistaken, that is for email directly to you. Are you still here, Bob? Oh, we we might we might have lost Bob. Okay, hang on a sec. Let me let me see if I can uh I'm going to try to uh See if I can still. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, there he is. Good. We, we, we still have you. I'm. I'm glad, Bob. Uh, did, okay. Did you, get a, did you get a chance to hear what uh, what I was saying? It's Players Congress at playerscongress.com. That is That's, your email. Yes, and and our and they can grab T-shirts at uh, playerscongress.com. That's right. the web. And, 
Right. And uh, Jason Dean, actually, when I was telling you that we, we had the, uh, the contest, if, if, uh, if I don't swear and if I don't swear, then I win. And, and, and I, and I was saying, Hey, you go to either playerscongress.com or shoes for kids. And actually Jason Dean did both. He went and, uh, he bought a shirt from playerscongress.com. And then he also, uh, sent some money away for shoes for kids. So Jason Dean definitely did a, a double, uh, in support for your causes as well. So he got a, and he got a great t-shirt and, uh, I'm sure Jerry was happy about the, uh, the money coming to uh, shoes for kids as well. Good man. He's good man. And, uh, and, and, uh, Don Webb was saying my ship is off course. Who is the XO when I had to move the ship's wheel, you know, but I, 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 that, I I'd like to be able to type, but you know, the, the ship's wheel was in the way. So we definitely, I, I hope it, I didn't uh, run aground anywhere, but if we were in deep seas, we're okay. But I, I don't think, I don't think we're good. Um, and uh, Don, Don wanted to talk with you, but uh, he was saying that uh, maybe the, the, the audio would not be the best, but uh, Don, as well as Mike, uh, we'll definitely be, be coming in here at another time when you're on. So we'll make sure. And again, I thank you for spending all this time with us as well, uh, Bob, because again, uh, you can't, you, you can't say uh, more realistically things that happen unless it truly happened to you. And uh, you know, the, sharing your thoughts and sharing your experiences of growing up and all the things that you went through and then putting the, the time to take away with, with the numbers that you had, again, you are, you are in charge of uh, the players, congress.com putting forth the numbers that you put forward in like median salaries and all those things like that with the athletes of today and what they can do if they so wished to do that, you know, it, it, it is, uh, I don't want to say it's mind boggling because I mean, it makes sense, but it's up to the athletes to figure out what they want to do and how how much forward that they wish to push these causes. They do have they do have power, Cap, and um, yeah, I don't care if they're in China here or whatever. They have to recognize the power that they have, and that exactly. power is the money that they're making. And again, no, there's no other nation on earth where a, a, a black man, a, and you said uh, the, those, what, 3,000, 4,000 millionaires? Uh, yeah. Yeah, three to 4,000 millionaires that are uh, African American that were, are putting or could have the wherewithal literally to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, that's right. And I don't want them to send it to me. <laughs> I'm too uh, I'm too old for you know to try to lead something like you know, this. I did my part back in the sixties. You know, now it is their turn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And again, uh Bob, and I want to want to say this as well for Raider Nation. Uh Bob Grant is already a member of the black hole. So he's already with us here. So you have really? a fellow you know, member of the black hole with us. We're going to say, hey, and I'll tell you what, we don't know what's going to happen this season. But in 2021, the Raiders are back. There you go. There you go. And as, as long, I tell you what, Bob, as long as I'm as long as I'm living and breathing and, and I and I am I am uh, continuing to make carbon dioxide from oxygen upright I, and I will be out there hopefully in a in a post covid world hanging out with you so we get a chance to uh, to hang out together in one of these wonderful events. And then obviously anytime you come to Florida, you know that you are uh, duly welcomed here. So, uh, and I, I want to say Don Webb and Mike Sarah, uh, Jason, uh, uh, Ken Asylum, all thanking you for your time here for the interview, sir. And uh, we, we will definitely make it a another time uh, where we, we can make sure that the, uh, Everything is kosher, good to go, and uh, it, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely enjoy spending some more time with you at, a, at another time as well. Yes, sir. I look forward to it. All right. 
Well, again, uh, oh, Jimmy was in here, but he was just kind of pissed off that his Islanders are losing to the Lightning. But uh, he was he he was uh, he was listening as well. But he's he's more of an Islanders fan than anything else right now. He he, uh, he he gave it to me when they finally beat my Flyers last week, so I understood where his head was at. <laughs> And oh, and 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 Vanessa, Vanessa Navarette was also in here. Uh, the the best, the bestest uh, Raiderette uh, lady, lady Raiderette in Colorado. Great, a great lady friend of mine. She thanks you for your time as well, uh, Mr. Grant. So again, uh, and I apologize, Vanessa. I forgot you were in here. It 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 wasn't me deliberately uh, making the ladies out, but I, I forgot you were here. So uh, apologies there. So yeah, we had, we had a fine member of the Raiderettes here as well there, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, again, folks, I'm going to let Mr. Grant go. Um, I'm going to go and, and, uh, probably watch the end of the game. Uh, Navy's getting her butt kicked by BYU as we speak. So that's not a good, not a good day for my, uh, midshipmen. Uh, but again, I want to thank Mr. Grant for his time here. And again, Bob, thank you, sir. Um, don't don't go away too quick when I end the broadcast because we'll talk uh, uh, off off camera. And again, I want to thank everybody for being here tomorrow night uh, over on Four Life Our Raider Story. Again, Four Life Our Raider Story. It'll be myself and silky, sexy, sultry, sassy. Saucy, sensational, sarcastic Santangela. That's a lot to say. I, I, lo I love it, but it's a lot to say out of my mouth. Uh, her and the Salty Captain will be having our regular show, but over there on their YouTube channel, For Life, Our Raider Story, join us, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. And again, thanks again to Mr. Bob Grant, retired NFL Players Congress. And again, if you need to get a hold of him via email, it's playerscongress at playerscongress.com. Thanks again, folks. We'll see you uh, tomorrow night. And, and uh, Cap, that is bouncing. That mail is bouncing. Now we've got. Well, you you know how they do uh, do us. For some reason, our mail's been bouncing for two or three days, but it should be back up and running by the middle of the week. Out. Okay. And again, if you if you uh, if you can, also on Facebook. It's uh, Bob, and I, I, I don't want to screw up that K, that K name, Bob. So it's Bob, what's the next word? <laughs> Kave. Kave. Okay, so Bob, K -A -A yeah, K-A-E-W-E, -E, right? No, God. K-E-K-K-E-A-W. Okay, I, I, again, so I, I go to the source on that one. Bob K E A W E Grant. Look him up on Facebook and uh send him a friend request. Great guy. And then uh this way if God forbid that the uh that the emails are bouncing to uh the players congress, send him a friend request. I'm I'm sure that uh, if you're a friend of mine, he'll he'll pick you up and uh so he'll he'll make sure that he gets back to you. And again, thank you for joining our broadcast. Be here tomorrow night. For my next broadcast over on the For Life Our Raiders Story uh, YouTube channel. I'm going to end this, Bob, but don't go away. We'll see y'all, okay. everybody, next time here with the Black Shield and Gallon Wheel webcast. This Friday, this Friday, Super Bowl man on the spot for the Raiders in uh, Super Bowl 18, and that would be Jack Squirek. Good night, everybody. Take care. We'll see y'all tomorrow night as well.